we'll talk on the uh, and there, uh, bring this section in and perhaps in a little bit in the middle but I don't think you'll have any trouble keeping it uh, in the proper order can you hear me in the back row well the, the microphone isn't intended to carry the full room I guess I could put the other one on see if that helps any. I think it's partly the background because I've taught in this room before and if you'll quit banging the seats quite so long I don't think we'll have so much trouble. The uh, subject we were talking about is wine as alcohol and there are just a few words I'd like to bring in about about this subject to, so we're all on the same wavelength. As a medical usage situation, wine and other alcoholic beverages can have some value. The use, ah, there we are, the use for medical purposes can be uh, important, although there are certain instances when use for medical purposes uh, would be uh, a bad idea. So that we'd like just briefly to mention a few of those. I think the occasions when the use of wine or other alcoholic beverage would be bad, uh, these cases are fairly obvious. We've said that alcohol is metabolized by the liver, and if you have a sick liver, you should stay away from alcoholic beverages. So in cases of a deficient liver, do not drink alcohol. And your uh, doctor will quickly advise you in this regard if you have hepatitis or similar conditions. Uh, if you have an active ulcer or a tendency to reactivate an ulcer, peptic ulcer, uh, then wine or other alcohol is not a good idea because alcohol stimulates gastric flow, gastric juices. Therefore, you're going to be adding to your ulcer problem if you uh, consume alcohol. Uh, kidney disease is also a case where you shouldn't have alcoholic beverage because uh, the excretion of the extra fluid and to some extent the diuretic effect of alcohol would put extra load on the kidney. Acute depression would be another contraindication for alcohol. Since alcohol is a depressant, you'd be adding to your problem. And of course, the rare instances where you might be allergic to wine or uh, other components of alcoholic beverages, such as might be found in whiskey. I don't know of any instances of allergy to alcohol, and considering the nature of the uh, molecule, it would be rather unlikely that anyone would be uh, uh, allergic to alcohol itself. And the final reason would be if you have a strong prejudice against alcohol, religious or other, uh, certainly no doctor would want to uh, uh, give you something that would uh, uh, cause you mental anguish, and in that case, uh, alcoholic beverage should be avoided also. On the other hand, there are some instances where alcohol, and from my viewpoint, perhaps more uh, important instances in the general population sense where it might be useful. For instance, alcohol can serve as a useful sedative, a uh, sleep producing uh, agent. Uh, it is a useful tranquilizer and as has been expressed by Dr. Lucia among others, if alcohol were to be suddenly discovered uh, next week, uh, it would be a uh, subject of considerable interest in the medical literature and a uh, great deal of uh, publicity because it does have uh, considerable use as a tranquilizer and more so in, in greater safety in many other aspects uh, than some things that have been used uh, and got considerable publicity recently. So that uh, it has value in that regard. It is an ap appetite stimulant. Particularly wine may be an appetite stimulant, not only because of the effects of alcohol in stimulating appetite, partly through stimulation of gastric juice flow, but also partly because uh, the ver variety added to the diet, the nice flavors that are possible in wine, and adding this then to a meal gives extra interest. And you can see where this would be particularly important in the elderly, say the geriatric patient or the convalescent where their diet has probably been pretty bad in a hospital, insipid, uh, bland foods, then a little bit of wine can do a lot to their morale as well as their appetite uh, and help uh, this situation. Uh, sp specific examples where alcohol could be useful would be in the case of 
some instances of diabetes. Remember that uh, so-called sugar diabetes is a, a deficiency in ability to metabolize carbohydrates or sugars. And remember that we said alcohol is metabolized as a fat. Therefore, uh, the alcohol could serve as a source of calories and dietary interest and appetite stimulation in a person who otherwise is restricted to a diet that is not uh, uh, terribly interesting and is, uh, uh, must watch his carbohydrate load. There are other effects of alcohol on blood sugar, however, so that it wouldn't be a, I shouldn't stand here and recommend that if you are a diabetic, you should immediately start drinking wine. First of all, it should be dry wine, dry with wine without any sugar. And secondly, it should be subject to a doctor's advice because there are other effects on blood sugar besides the direct uh, uh, alcohol metabolism story, which is favorable. Nevertheless, it is generally true that for diabetics, uh, dry table wines can be quite a nice addition to the diet and useful. Uh, another instance uh, is in case of low sodium diets where you have hypertension, high blood pressure. Uh, the wine naturally is very low in sodium and very high in potassium and this is exactly what you want in such a diet where you're trying to restrict sodium intake because not only does this, is the sodium low but the high potassium tends to wash out further sodium from the from the body. Plant foods in general are high in, in potassium. It's one reason why the cows have to have a salt lick because uh, they need sodium. They have so much potassium that they wash all the sodium out of their body and if they don't get some sodium from sodium chloride salt, uh, then they're in trouble. But since we're pretty heavily, uh, up to last week at least, meat eaters, uh, we have a fair high sodium intake and we need to go the other way. And wine is a good way to do it. So that it can be very nice in this case. And then, of course, it does have some diuretic effects that can be medically useful, and that's tied in with the sodium because one reason you want to lower sodium is to lower fluid retention. So if you combine diuretic effect with low sodium content, uh, then wine would be a very good addition for a high blood pressure type diet. And finally, alcohol and to some degree wine. It would be an emer emergency antiseptic uh, medicine vehicle and some odds and ends of that sort. Uh, in terms of possible medical utility. Uh, you know, when you get your arm swab before somebody gives you a shot, the solution used is generally about 70% alcohol because it makes a pretty good skin disinfectant. We wouldn't recommend drinking 70% alcohol, but uh, uh, if you're going to externally sterilize your skin, it does work well. The mag uh, this brings us then, having talked about uh, some of the uses of alcohol in a medical vein, how about some of the abuses of alcohol? Alcoholism is a large social problem. In this country, it's estimated that, depending on who's doing the estimator, the estimation, the person who's semi-favorably disposed or the person that's strongly against, you get figures all the way from one million alcoholics in the United States up to as high as uh, nine or more. I've seen nine million. I'm not sure whether probably hundreds you could find somebody that estimates it higher. Uh, I can't come up with a very good figure because the way you define an alcoholic is quite variable, but say probably according to at least fairly restrictive definitions, that is fairly inclusive definitions, uh, there's about 5 million alcoholics in the United States out of a little over 200 million people. And that's quite a big chunk. Uh, roughly one out of 18 people that drink alcohol are going to become a, uh, an alcoholic. And since there's... Uh, what, roughly uh, 15 times 18, I guess, in this class. That means uh, uh, there's going to be around 15 people in this class become alcoholics if we follow the uh, traditional statistics. Now, I hope our comments on the subject and maybe your greater intelligence and uh, uh, well-balanced natures will lead you away from this, so perhaps we will not have our quota, but in any case, it's not something to take lightly. And there was a long time when the feeling was that an alcoholic was somebody that had an inherent uh, uh, flaw in his makeup or her makeup. Uh, I think this idea is getting less and less prevalence. There may be some inherent flaws, I suppose, uh, and there is still some continuing evidence in that direction. But it's pretty clear that if you drink enough alcohol often enough and long enough, then you are an alcoholic, whatever you call yourself, so that apparently anyone has the potential of using alcohol to an excess where it will cause him 
personal and social problems and uh, uh, therefore he is by that definition an alcoholic. So you needn't say there's never been one in my family, I'm immune because you probably aren't and uh, you'd hate to be the first one to disgrace the family. I hope you would anyway. The uh, costs of alcoholism are very large to society in terms of lost labor, lost wages, and actual expenses due to uh, hospitalization, incarceration, and what have you that are associated with it. Uh, and so it isn't something to be taken lightly. On the other hand, we think wine tends to resist alcoholism, and we'll say a word or two about that in just a second. Why do you become an alcoholic? We don't have really solid answers, but we think there are some important revealing uh, stories. For instance, uh, it, I understand from reading a few articles in the literature that uh, actually addiction to opiates in hospital situations is not as great as one might suppose. Say you have uh, incurable cancer and uh, you're given a heavy level of of opiates, uh, then you find some miraculous cure occurs and you're uh, able to uh, stop the treatment with the opium derivatives. Uh, in the hospital where the drug is administered outside of your control by a nurse or a doctor and uh, so forth, your quote withdrawal symptoms unquote tend to be relatively minor apparently. And this has been noted uh, quite a bit. And not only that, it seems to tie in with the fact that when they were trying to study drug addiction with these definitely addictive type drugs in experimental animals, they found it was difficult to induce anything that resembled uh, human uh, addiction with the attendant withdrawal symptoms and so forth that uh, do occur. And the movies have tended to dramatize pretty uh, vividly. Uh, then someone hit on the idea that maybe it's related to self-administration. So they hooked up some rats with a harness in a cage so that they weren't terribly bothered by it and they had an implanted needle and then they had a foot pedal that the rat could push to get a jolt every so often and uh, they trained the rat to, to know what was going on and soon they had addicts apparently in the same sense as the human. In other words, the, every so often the rat would go push the pedal 10 times or whatever it took in order to get his uh, quota to make him feel the way he thought he ought to feel. And uh, then they withdrew the, they put in water or something instead of the opiate. And then the poor rat was over there pushing the pedal all day, you see. He had withdrawal symptoms and was running around the ca cage and generally uh, just as bad off as the humans would be. Whereas if uh, once a day he was given the equivalent shot by the handler, this same sort of uh, withdrawal didn't seem to occur. And it seems to me there's a lesson for us here in that the addictive type effect is at least partially psychological, even with such hard drugs as those and certainly with alcohol. So that if you're using the drug as an escape from reality uh, and uh, withdrawing from the uh, society and getting a fuzzy mind and so forth so you aren't able to think quite as well as you uh, did, it's easy to get into a reinforced pattern where you can't give it up. And the psychological addiction is an important component, particularly in alcohol. So don't use alcohol as a way to escape reality and uh, uh, get bombed and uh, uh, avoid reality. If you're feeling particularly bad, it's better to stay away from the alcohol. A little bit of alcohol when you're feeling fine, a nice dinner party or something like we had last night, and I hope I'm not too red-eyed today, uh, is, is much nicer and uh, as far as we know now causes no uh, problem, certainly not alcoholism. Well, that's a bit longer than I really intended to say. I would like to uh, close by saying a word or two about wine in relation to alcoholism. There have been a number of studies on why alcoholism is prevalent in some societies and not prevalent in some others. And ours, by the way, is uh, perhaps uh, uh, as bad as any. Uh, the, the societies that seem to have high alcoholism include ours, the Scandinavians, the Irish, uh, Northern Europeans in general, uh, whereas groups that tend to avoid alcoholism include the Jews, the Orientals, particularly the Chinese, uh, and uh, the Italians, so that, uh, and others. So that uh, why is this difference so? It might be genetic, but that's a pretty diverse group to think of uh, genetic uh, uh, corollaries. Uh, 
And we think, according to our best studies, that it's partly the way alcohol is consumed, so that the groups that do not have alcoholism tend to consume alcohol in a family environment, usually wine with meals. Uh, there's no particularly strong positive or negative attitude toward alcohol. It's just a thing, and it's part of uh, daily life, no big deal. Uh, early contact seems important. The child is, sees the parents consuming alcohol uh, as a matter of course and not getting drunk and behaving themselves. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, things that tend to lead you toward alcoholism are uh, the idea that alcohol is a big deal, that you're a bigger man or I suppose a greater woman if you can uh, uh, take more than the next person and you contact it as a part of becoming an adult which you see isn't always the greatest in the U.S. system, and a strong parental attitude, either great salesmen for alcohol or great uh, anti-alcohol attitudes on the part of the parents seem to promote alcoholism. Um, the, uh, Milton Silverman, who has uh, worked with the Wine Institute on studying some of these things, uh, made a, a very amusing comment. He said that if you want to be sure that you're not going to be an alcoholic, you should be uh, a Catholic raised in Italy with a Chinese mother and a Jewish father. <laughs> That's a little bit hard to uh, come by, but uh, if, if you had arranged it that way, then you'd be almost certain you wouldn't be an alcoholic. And the rest of us who couldn't quite arrange that, I come from an Irish line, I have very big danger, I suppose, uh, we have to try to emulate their attitudes. And uh, the final word uh, seems to be that the Italian boy, say, who seems to be insulated against being an alcoholic, has uh, grown up in a situation where wine is served every, practically every meal, certainly every day, every meal but breakfast in many households, and breakfast included in some, and uh, probably got wine mixed with water even as a small child. And typically he's running around the table after aunties and uncles have left uh, dinner and there's quite a bit of wine left in the glass and it's not diluted with water and he decides, say, that tasted pretty good. I'll get this down real quick before anybody sees me and I'll finish up what was left in the glass. And he takes about five glasses in a hurry that was left on the table and of course being under 100 pounds and so forth, it doesn't take very long before it has a rather serious effect on him and he's likely to feel very bad in a big hurry and uh, perhaps next morning he still feels pretty terrible and if the father then says, well now wasn't that a childish thing to do, uh, you see the grown-ups don't do that kind of thing and uh, now that you've uh, learned your lesson, I hope you remember it from now on and it would be very uh, embarrassing to the family if you should ever be drunk in public and, and let's don't have this childish kind of behavior and so forth. Well that seems to be the kind of attitude that leads away from alcoholism and we think wine does help a lot in this regard. It's a table beverage, it's served with meals, usually in a family setting, fairly low alcohol content, and perhaps the connoisseur approach, the idea that let's drink good wine or none at all, is also rather favorable toward avoiding alcohol. So having spent uh, 17 minutes on that, I must hurry along to talking about grapes as the royal, raw material for wine. If you have more questions on wine and alcohol, then bring it up in discussion group, and I rather hope there will be a good, strong discussion on this subject. In discussing the ways you can make wine differently, there are three basic categories of differences. The first is, of course, the grape. You can't make wine at all without grapes, and obviously if you had uh, pomegranates instead of grapes, it'd make quite a difference in your... Uh, ways of making wine. The second is the way you ferment the product to make the wine and the third is processing after fermentation and the aging process. So those three basic areas will cause differences in the way you will make wine and the way you will profit from having made wine. The grape then is the first essential and the indispensable one and from our per uh, current commentary viewpoint is the one we should bring up first. Uh, the variety of grape is very important because the variety itself can have a special flavor or special characteristics that have a lot to do with the quality of the wine when you get through. And then the way the grape was grown, the kind of weather that was uh, pre prevalent at the time, and the time of harvesting have also a large effect. Before we go ahead and talk in any more detail about some of these effects, 
I, I should point out that the grape, as we've already said, is particularly adapted for making wine. The uh, reason it's particularly adapted are primarily three. The grape has a high sugar level. There's almost no other fruit that naturally reaches the same sugar level and the high sugar level of the wine grape. Uh, dates and, and uh, dried fruits, uh, figs, tend to get as high as 20 or more percent sugar, but that's partly from water loss. And of course, raisins and prunes get up there too. On the other hand, talking about the fresh fruit without drying, there are just almost none that will reach 25% sugar on their own without appreciable drying, and the wine grape will. So getting enough sugar to make a high level of alcohol, which then preserves the product, is one of the reasons that the wine grape is so well adapted for wine. And this is inherent, although it has been bred up to some degree in the grape used for wine. Uh, secondly, the uh, nutrients required by yeast are high in the uh, grape, the wine grape. Particularly nitrogen content is very good, and so you don't need to add any nutrients to grape juice, to uh, wine grape juice, to make it ferment properly. Whereas many other things that you'd want to ferment, uh, you would have to add nutrients. And this is one reason why many home winemaking recipes call for adding raisins. If you're going to make, say, dandelion wine, it may require that you add raisins as a base. That's partly to contribute sugar, but also partly to contribute other nutrients for the yeast. So this is an, a second important factor. And thirdly, as naturally occurring in the vineyard, the average uh, wine grape contains some, or on its surface, uh, has some wine yeast, so that the yeasts are associated with the grape to a greater extent than most other fruit, partly because most other fruit are going to be peeled. If you're going to make orange wine, you wouldn't throw in whole oranges, you'd peel the orange first. Whereas if you're going to make grape wine, you do generally allow contact at least uh, with the juice and the skins, just by breaking up the skins and getting the juice out, which would mean the yeast would be washed off the skin into the uh, fermenting or the solution to be fermented and this at least historically was a good reason for converting or a good reason it was easy to convert wine grapes into wine. I'd like to say a word or two about viticulture as a big business. Uh, viticulture, the growing of grapes, is a very large business. Uh, it's very important and perhaps the most prosperous agricultural business right now in California and in, uh, in the world in general it's uh, quite prosperous right now. The uh, order of magnitude of grape growing is large. For instance, uh, in, in terms of acres, the growing of grapes, uh, the acres is largest in Spain, uh, second largest in uh, Italy, third in France. This is now, if, if we're talking about acreage and the United States or California primarily is about 12th. This is on acreage, and of the total acreage, there's about 25 million acres. Now, 25 million acres is not a large uh, part. There's estimated to be 3.5 billion acres of cropped uh, land in the world. On the other hand, it's not insignificant either. So 25 million acres out of a total of 3.5 billion means that grape acreage is are quite significant as a single crop. Uh, on terms of wine gallons, the order somewhat changes. Uh, Italy today is generally first in wine. Total gallons produced, France generally second. Sometimes they reverse depending on the crop year. Uh, and uh, or they used to reverse quite often, but I think it's uh, not so true lately. Spain having low yield of grapes per acre uh, gets uh, less wine, so it runs third, and California runs about ninth. And the main point we want to make here is then with about 2% of the grape acreage in California, 2% of the world's grape acreage, we make about 6% of the world's total grape products, particularly wine. So this has to mean that we have a pretty good viticulture, fairly efficient, a fairly uh, high level of production, uh, in California, which is one of the things that uh, we are proud of, partly due to uh, 
God smiling on California as a climatic region and so forth, and partly due to uh, our engineering and technology and viticulture that has made our growing uh, particularly productive. Typical cost, to give you some idea, uh, would be land costs in California today are running of the order of $4,000 per acre. If you're going to buy acreage that's suitable to turn into a good vineyard, uh, you can get numbers all the way from 1,000 up, but I think 4,000 isn't a bad uh, figure. And if you're going to start with bare ground, you're going to have to put in about another $4,000 an acre to condition the land, get the grapes planted, put in perhaps a sprinkling system and all the other things that need to be done. So you're likely to have an investment of the order of $8,000 an acre before you uh, even have uh, any grapes to harvest. It's going to take you about four years to yield any sort of a crop because the vines have to grow. And then on the fifth year, you'll beginning to begin to show an operating profit. By an operating profit, I mean only a profit on this year's operation. In other words, the interest on your investment and so forth could be covered by the fifth year. But then to pay off your capital cost, it's going to take a long time. I've heard a number of people say that they don't see how it ever will be paid off. That remains to be seen. If prosperity continues like it has been, it won't be bad. But if grape prices drop much, then there are going to be people that are going to worry about how do I ever get to own this land and pay off my mortgage on it. The total production of U.S. grapes, largely in California, represents about 14% of the world's total of table grapes, about a third of the world's total of raisins, uh, uh, about 6% uh, uh, of the world's total of wine. But in terms of U.S. production, it's very near 100% on the raisins and table grapes. And uh, uh, what little grapes are canned, like in fruit cocktail, almost 100%, I guess probably 100% from U.S. sources. And about 80% of the wine used in the United States comes from California. And then about uh, half of the remainder is imported and the other half from states other than California. So you get an idea of the scope of viticulture. It is a big business. Uh, I've made estimates uh, which are not very valid anymore because economics are changing so fast, but at least six to eight billion dollars, maybe as much as 15 billion dollars is invested in uh, capital equipment and so forth in connection with the wine industry of California. And it certainly is big business in any way you look at it and an important and growing business, growing so rapidly that it's uh, practically impossible to keep up with who owns what winery, much less who owns what vineyard. This then brings us to saying a word or two about the botanical family tree of grapes. And I don't think I'll emphasize this very strongly, but uh, you should realize, and I think you would, that a grape is a spermatophyte. What's a spermatophyte? A spermatophyte is a seed-bearing plant. If you've ever eaten any grape except Thompson seedless, you would know that a grape is a seed bearing, uh, come from a seed bearing plant. So it is a seeded plant and it is a dicotyledon, uh, the class of dicotyledony if you're a botanist, uh, as opposed to a monocotyledon. Now, if you remember grasses and the plants with parallel leaf veins like banana and so forth are, uh, are monocotyledons, certainly grape doesn't look anything like that. I trust you've all seen a grapevine living in California so that uh, you would not expect it to be anything but a dicotyledon. And then we br it brings us to the order, and that's briefly of interest. The order that includes grapes is Ramnales, and it's of brief interest because there are only two families. Ramnaceae and Vitaceae, and of course you know which one is going to be the, including the grapes, that's the Vitaceae. The Vitaceae, the family including grapes, has only Ramnaceae uh, joining it in the order, and there are no food plants of importance in the Ramnaceae, and other than grapes, there aren't in the Vitaceae either. So the, what this means is that the grape is a relatively isolated plant botanically, and that shouldn't be any great surprise. If you think of the way a grapevine looks, you know, it's a vine or a, or a limber tree-like thing that won't stay up unless you put it on a post. Uh, and uh, it, it, what other crop can you think of that has any sort of resemblance to it? I don't think you can think of one, at least I can. Uh, maybe you might think of passion fruit, but that's quite different in terms of an annual and 
or a less permanent vine and that sort of thing. So uh, I take my word for it that botanically speaking, the grapes are rather isolated. And it turns out that among the uh, Ramnaceae, for instance, there are a number of plants that are rather poisonous. So it's rather good that the grapes uh, are as uh, friendly as they are. Uh, in the Vitaceae, there are a few genera, but the only one that we need to be concerned with is Vitus. And that is the genus of grapes. And if you are not uh, acquainted with botanical nomenclature, I should tell you that when you give a scientific name to a plant, you give the genus name first. It should be capitalized. And if it's printed, it'll be printed in italics. Since we're not able to print, why we underline it to signify italics. So Vitus vinifera is the European grape species. And if you translate the Latin into uh, English, vinifera means wine bearer. So the, the grape that bears wine is Vitus vinifera. It is the European grape. And it was native to the Caspian Sea area. Uh, it is uh, found wild still in a few places there. And it was domesticated at least 25,000 BC. Uh, by domesticated, we mean that it was grown on purpose, planted and cultivated and handled as a domesticated plant. And this has been proven by looking at grape seeds left in burnt offerings in ancient Greece at alder sites and things of this sort. So that uh, we can prove that at least that far back, the grape was a cultivated, deliberately produced crop. And that's one of the oldest, uh, outside of perhaps cereals, there aren't any others that I can think of that are older. So it is a very old plant. And it turns out that although this is the European wine grape, it is now the significant wine grape all over the world because it was the wine grape for the Romans, the Greeks, the Phoenicians, and wherever they went, uh, England or wherever they planted these grapes. Sometimes they didn't do very well, like in England, um, where, unless you put it in a greenhouse. But in any case, uh, it was planted everywhere. And in the New World, the Spanish, Spanish uh, and Portuguese colonists brought you know, European grapes to South America. And then they came up through the mission chain through Mexico to California. And the wine grape business of the world is built wherever you find it, South Africa, Australia, California, on the European wine grape. So that is the significant grape that we should know the most about. It has been domesticated, as I say, roughly 5,000 years, 2,500 uh, BC, and almost uh, that long since. Uh, in 5,000 years, it's not unreasonable that about 5,000 cultivars have been produced. A cultivar is a contraction of cultivated varieties. So these are named cultivated varieties. And we're not going to ask you to remember, or we wouldn't ask advanced viticulture students to remember 5,000 named cultivars. Certainly, I don't know them either. But uh, the point is that it's not unreasonable to expect 5,000 cultivars to arise over a period of nearly 5,000 years. Every farmer that grows grapes is interested in finding a vine that has bigger fruit, or prettier fruit, or earlier ripening fruit, or what have you. Having found such a vine, he is going to propagate it. And uh, we'll get to this point later. But since grapes are propagated by vegetative cuttings, not generally by seed unless you're in a breeding program, if you cut a piece off of this plant and then root it and plant it in a new place, in effect, you have a twin sister of that plant. So it's really the same plant being multiplied. In fact, if this is done, then that's called a clone, C-L-O-N-E. A clone is a line of plants drawn from one single mother vine or mother plant. Well, the varieties are basically this way, so that if you take a cutting off a plant in a vineyard in Germany, bring it to California under proper quarantine investigation and so forth, and grow it in your vineyard, then you're going to have exactly the same fruit uh, as was on that plant in Germany, except that as weather or other conditions would influence it. So being vegetatively propagated, then these many varieties are kept pure and can be separate. Of course, many of them are not very interesting. They may be uh, freaks of uh, limited interest, but from a commercial viewpoint, they have no great interest. So probably there's a 30 or so important wine varieties that are significant for high quality wine around the world. And before the course is over, I would trust you'd recognize the names of most of them and be able to give a few of them. The 
other species of grapes that are of importance are generally from the New World, particularly North America. So we have the European wine grape, and I want to emphasize its importance, but we have others then, and ouch, Vitus labrusca is another one. This grape is native to the North Atlantic coast of the United States and inland uh, uh, for a considerable distance, even so far as Indiana where I was raised. It's commonly known as the fox grape, yeah, I guess from Aesop's uh, fables of the fox and the grapes, but in any case, uh, it is said to have a foxy flavor. Now, the, I don't know how many of you have smelled a fox, or eat, and certainly nobody's eaten one recently, uh, but uh, it's a little hard to equate that name with the flavor, except just it's the name given to it. Uh, sometimes, in my opinion, uh, I've smelled a few fox dens. They have a very characteristic and rank odor. And I've had a few uh, wines that were kept too long, not good fresh wines of this variety, uh, spoiled bad wines that do have sort of a fox den odor to them. I'm not trying to put this down because uh, this is indicative more of New York and other parts of the United States than of California. On the other hand, it is true that they do have a distinctive flavor commonly called foxy that derives from a chemical methyl anthranilate, which is the same chemical that's used in synthetic grape chewing gum and uh, pop and that kind of thing. So if you think of uh, something, say, well, I hate to name brands, but if you think of a, of a grape drink that is synthetic and that uh, rather pungent uh, uh, grape jam, grape juice, Welsh's grape juice type odor, uh, is, uh, is the compound, or at least partly the compound, methyl anthranilate, which is unique, unique to this kind of grape. And the other wild grapes, that is the American so-called wild grapes, have these wild type flavors. None others have the foxy flavor, but all of them have some strong flavor. And these strong flavors tend to make the product not very uh, exciting and interesting from a wine consumption viewpoint because the flavor is very recognizable, it's rather overpowering, and it becomes too strong rather quickly. On the other hand, it does help you identify them so that the classic variety in the Labrusca group is Concord, and that's the main grape of all the purple grape juice that you've consumed all your life and uh, uh, certain uh, conquered wines uh, that, that are widely sold, particularly in the East. Uh, there are several other varieties that would be of Labrusca origin and they all have the foxy type flavor. Then there are other varieties in the American group. So this is the European group and this is the American group. Uh, another one would be Vitus rotundifolia. Now, if you're writing a whole series of these names, it's quite possible to, have, quite legal to abbreviate the name V period. But generally speaking for this class, so we're sure we know what we're talking about, we'd prefer you don't do that. On the other hand, we might do it on a test, so you should, should recognize that having given it once, then it's considered legitimate to abbreviate it from then on. But another one would be Vitus rotundifolia. And as you would guess from the name, it means large rotund leaves. So Vitus rotundifolia is a grape that is native to the southern Atlantic region, uh, Virginia and that part of the world, and uh, is often called, and the significant variety is scuppernong. An Indian word, I don't know what it means. Probably, wow, isn't that a crazy grape? but it is a rather crazy grape. It has a very strange and delectable flavor. Uh, on the other hand, it is rather strongly flavored, even more so, I think, than the foxy, and uh, it is uh, something you might need to learn to like. We've been recently making some Scuppernong wine, and uh, I will say that a small sip of Scuppernong wine, or wines of Rotundifolia at least, tend to stay with you, and you can taste the same flavor in your mouth for an hour or so later. And that may be a bit much if you're trying to serve it with a nice meal and not overpower the food and so forth. So if you're raised in Virginia, you probably love the flavor and we'd like very much to have a bottle of wine every Christmas, but uh, you might not be a great wine drinker, partly because you came from Virginia and partly because, uh, <laughs> partly because uh, this kind of wine is uh, 
a little bit strong and, and while it's delectable, it tends to be uh, something you wouldn't want to drink a great deal of even if you liked it. There are several other species that might be mentioned, all American, for instance, Vitus riparia and Vitus rupestris and in California, Vitus californiana and others could be Maine. Californica is another name given to it. In any case, these, generally speaking, are not used for fruit, but rather used for crossbreeding with uh, Vitus vinifera to produce certain characteristics, particularly disease resistance. So they are used as uh, either for crossing purposes or for grafting purposes, and I might as well bring that up right now. There are pests that live in the soil that are native to the United States, native to North America, and are not uh, tolerated by the European grape. In fact, when these pests arrived in Europe, they devastated the European vineyards, and the most famous one is a little root louse called phylloxera. The word means dry leaf, and the phylloxera gets on the vineyard while it kills the leaves in a hurry, and you have dried leaves in your vineyard. And if your parents are French and you migrated to this country about 1870 to 1900, or your ancestors did, chances are the reason you came was because you were driven out by that little root louse, because many grape farmers in France and other parts of the world were forced to migrate for economic reasons at about 1860 through 1900 by the devastation of this insect introduced from the North American continent where some of these varieties, or some of these species are resistant but the European grape is not, just like smallpox was on the Indians, you see. So that uh, uh, the, the introduction of this pest led to the need to either breed by crossing and getting seed and growing new varieties uh, fruit that would be making wine like Vitus vinifera, but would have some of the resistance that was built in due to long association between the North American pests, not only phylloxera, but others, and the, uh, the new crossed variety. If you can uh, visualize, however, and you know something about grafting, there is another alternative. Since phylloxera is a root uh, pest. It lives largely in the soil except under special circumstances and some of the other pests do too. Then you can grow, say, Vitus rupestris, get a fairly nice vine, cut it off, throw the top away, and so you have Vitus rupestris roots, and then graft to this and allow to grow on it the vine from Vitus vinifera. And this is called the scion, and this is called the rootstock, And the whole process is called grafting. So you graft a European grape scion onto an American rootstock that is resistant to the certain diseases and you have solved your problem. You get fruit just like the European. The root has some effect on the health of the vine and so on, but it doesn't have any effect on the chemical composition inherent in the grape. So it doesn't get a foxy flavor, for instance, if you have a Labrusca rootstock and a, and a vinifera a scion. So that this is the way that the vineyards were brought back into production in France and other countries where they were devastated by these American pests. So the value of many of the American species, even if they don't produce fruit that we would commonly use, is to allow us to breed for special characteristics, particular resistance to cold weather, resistance to pests, including phylloxera, resistance to certain diseases. And the vitus vinifera generally lacks all of these things from a North American viewpoint because we're breeding for resistance against pests that are originally unique to North America but now have often been disseminated around the world. We have then two kinds of resistance. We have the crossbred which leads to what is called a direct producer And the direct producer is one that you need not graft then. It is, has the resistance bred into it and you may keep it on its own roots and it will still uh, resist these conditions. But the more common circumstance today is grafting the European grape onto the resistant rootstock. 
So those are the two ways of accomplishing the result. Ultimately, we will want to have the direct producers do the job. But at the moment, at least, we haven't had sufficient generations to produce uh, grapes that are direct producers that have the fruit characteristics we want from the European wine grape viewpoint and the vineyard characteristics we want from the American grape viewpoint. Although a great deal of progress has been made and the resurgence or upsurge of the industry of viticulture in, California, in Oregon, Washington, New York, Pennsylvania, and a few other places is partly owing to development of better and better direct producers. You may hear the direct producers sometimes called also French hybrids, which is kind of a misnomer because although they may have been made in France, the breeding work, a lot of it was done in France, at least the breeding for this kind of result, uh, they are in fact crosses between European grapes and American. So they, some people call them American hybrids too, uh, and it can be a little confusing. Now I think this covers about all we need to say about these, except I'd like to point out two things to you. One is that if we have all this array of, of wines that could be made from all these species of grapes, and we've talked about the European grape, having not a very distinctive flavor, and the uh, wild types from the North American continent having foxy or scuppernong or other strong flavors. Uh, one of the things that will help you identify a wine and one of the things that will turn you into a connoisseur quicker than anything else in your uh, neighbor's eyes would be the ability to taste a wine and then say something about that's probably such and such uh, a grape uh, that made that wine. So in your book, there is a table of uh, grape varieties, which I would like for you to spend a little bit of time on and learn a, an example, I think, from each of the categories. Maybe it would be wise to learn two, one white grape and one red grape, or at least one grape used to make red wine and one grape used to make white wine in each of the categories. Well, what are the categories? We've divided the, the grape varieties in the categories based on flavor distinctiveness. And since the non-vinifera grapes are generally highly distinctive, we've lumped them all together. It doesn't mean to say they all have the same flavor, but the uh, distinctive non-vinifera group would include Concord as a good example of a, of a red, and say Catawba as a good example of one that's usually used to make white wine. Catawba, in fact, has a slight brownish pink color, but it's usually used to make uh, white wine. So those would be examples there, but certainly Scuppernong would be a white rotunda folia would fit in this group too. Then the distinctive vitus viniferas would be the most important group from a wine quality viewpoint. And we've divided that into two subgroups, the muscat flavored wines and the others. The muscat flavored ones, the muscat aroma is like Daphne flowers, if you know that odor. It's a very pungent, uh, slightly citrusy, uh, very uh, flowery odor. And once recognized, if you've eaten muscat grapes, you probably recognize what I'm talking about. It's very easily recognized. It's almost as distinctive as the foxy flavor, and for that reason, may, you may find it tiring and too strong. Then, beside the muscat group, there, there is the other distinctive European wine grape types. Distinctive in that the flavor can usually be recognized, and this is the most important group, but a very varied group. There's Cabernet Sauvignon as a good example of a red, Pinot Noir is another, and Zinfandel and others could be named, whereas on the white, say white Riesling, Chardonnay, Pinot Blanc, and so on, would be good examples there. And most of the important wine grapes of the world fall in this group. And then finally, we have the non-distinctive group. The non-distinctive group would all be vitus vinifera, but they would not uh, uh, have a flavor that when you drank the wine, you'd be able to say that's such and such a variety. Now, why would you have such varieties? One reason you'd have such varieties is that they yield very well. Uh, they may have good viticultural characteristics. They are uh, fairly easily grown in the vineyard, high production, that kind of thing so that uh, you can make very good, inexpensive wine from these non-distinctive varieties. And with that, I think I'll have to quit. We will go ahead then when I return on the environmental effects on the grape. If you didn't pick up an outline, please do so.